within your presence I sing beneath the shadow of your wings Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts Than thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask, and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, than thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out to you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. Tasted and I've seen Come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you To you Oh, yeah. 
everyone can you all hear us okay great good morning welcome to icoc sunday online worship service yes uh, it's a privilege for us to do the welcome this morning and uh, before we proceed with our worship service i would like to introduce i'm chris reyes and this is my beautiful wife heidi hello and we would like to share a few verses from the bible in Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 15 to 16, my, my wife will read it. Yes, let's go there. Colossians 3, verse 15 to 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. For me, I'm personally grateful to God every day for um, be able to, you know, wake up with good health, be able to do normal things. Um, this is one thing that I don't forget. And I hope everyone um, be reminded and I mean, not to forget this as well, you know, to say thank you to God for the undeserved gift of life. Amen. Uh, that's uh, really uh... We have to be thankful every day and it's all uh, a blessing for us to to have this uh, freedom to worship uh, mm. this Sunday. I know in uh, some parts of the world they're restricted and we have this platform to, to be able to see each other just even online. And uh, as what the scripture said, uh, let the peace of Christ dwell in our hearts. I mean, I know there are a lot of troubles that we could could have encountered uh, the past days. And I hope that we will all set that aside Mm. And uh, just uh, focus on uh, worshiping our Lord. And and for that, uh, I just want to, again, welcome everyone to our Sunday worship service. Uh, we will have a great lineup today. We are privileged to hear our dear brother, David Bruce, all the way from L.A. to preach the word to us this morning. Yay. And before, before that, uh, we, we will also have uh, Tosin and Latoya who will uh, lead us to the communion. And uh, for the closing and announcement, it will be done by Gary and Arlene Galope. Uh, again, let's uh, bow our heads and let's pray to start our worship service. Almighty God in heaven, Lord, thank you, Lord, for uh, this morning that we wake, wake up. We are in good health. We have this uh, opportunity to just being able to, to worship you, to sing songs to you. Again, we, we pray that uh, whatever is hindering our hearts and minds to focus on our worship with you this morning, we pray that may your, your Holy Spirit uh, guide all of us to be able to just focus on, on hearing your message preached to us this morning. Thank you again. May you be with all those, uh, all the, the people who will be part of this worship service. Uh, Guide your hearts and minds also. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus gathered the twelve disciples to share the Passover meal once more,
exists the sign of a brand new promise. I will be born out to set you free. church. Can we all hear me? Perfect. It's good to be here this morning with brothers and sisters uh, to worship God and to and have a great time. Uh, apology, Toya is not going to be able to join me this morning here because she's taking care of the, our new general manager. Uh, you, you, you guys understand that we, uh, we have a new baby, so <laughs> right. 
Uh, I have so many, and I hope I won't have to borrow additional three minutes from Bassam and, and Jacob. Don't worry, they're not going to say no. So, so it's fine. Um, please permit me to share my screen. Great. We've come to the time in our church service where we partake in the Holy Communion. Uh, shortly, the bread and wine will be shared in our various homes. And to our friends who are worshiping with us for the first time, the bread represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ and the wine, the blood is shed on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of my sin and yours. And this great sacrifice has given us an opportunity to be here this morning, to come in, to fellowship, most importantly, to remember Jesus Christ there on the cross of Calvary. Before we proceed, I have this little message to prepare our mind and at the same time encourage us this morning. Amen. Now, this is a question from my from one of my previous quiet times. Say, how can God be merciful, loving, and at the same time just? So a guilty sin. You see, if, if justice and mercy are both hearts to each other, they are opposite to each other. And how are they very important to God's plan for mankind? Are you thinking with me, say, how can God love a sinner and at the same time just to this same sinner? I have an illustration for us this morning. For some of us whose day-to-day -day activities depend on computer, we would never pray that our computer is infected with virus, right? Because it destroys, if not everything, almost everything. Immediately we detect or we have any feeling of our computer being infected with virus, we start avoiding such computer. We don't want to keep anything on that computer. In fact, we start advising our friends and colleagues, you know what, please stay away from my computer for now until it's clean. So what happened? We start looking for antivirus, right? And until we're sure that the computer is clean, we will not have anything to do with that computer. Correct? So, so the problem is not the computer. The problem is the virus. The enemy is it's not, a, it's not a computer. The enemy is the virus that find its way in one way or the other into the computer. And because of this enemy, we disengaged, we restrict, and we distance ourselves from our computer because we want to protect our files, other people's files, ourselves from being corrupted by virus. Does that mean I don't want my computer or I don't like my computer? No. I want my computer, and that's why I start looking for antivirus. The amazing part of it is this, the moment my computer is virus clean, I get back to that computer. I start using that computer again. I have, I have this confidence in the computer. I start pulling all my files back there again. Because again, the, the, the problem is not the virus, the computer is the virus. So for me, I call this a perfect illustrative explanation of Isaiah 59, one or two. And I want you to read it together with me. I want you to personalize it when I read it. But I, want to, like, I want you to read it like you are, is addressing you. Let's, let's read it. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse one, it says, surely the hand of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. No, but my iniquities, have separated me from my God. My sin have hidden my face from him so that he will not hear me. It's, it's my iniquities that have separated me from my God. My sins called this distance, hid his face from him and he couldn't hear me. So one thing that is very assuring is that the problem is not me. The problem is or are the sins in me. There has distanced me from God. So God loves me so much. That is a fact. He has reassured me in different scriptures in the Bible. He cares for me. He wants me. But at the same time, he cannot stand sin in my life. This is God's standard. This is God's policy when it comes to sin. Irrespective of who you are, whether you're a disciple of Jesus Christ or you're not, whether you're a believer or you're not, whatever you have, this is God's standard. And it makes it clear in the great scripture, Matthew 27, when Jesus Christ said, why have you forsaken me? Now, there are so many scholars who've, who've debated that scripture, saying, no, God did not forsake. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that today. That's another topic, another time. But the fact is that there is no reason why God is going to distance himself from his only begotten son, if not for the fact that he is carrying all the body in the sin of the entire world at that time. So the problem, again, it's not me. So, 
And this is it. Sometimes when I feel that God is far away from me, when I feel that God is not listening to me, when I feel that God is, is silent around me, like why is he not caring about me? Among many reasons that could cause this, among many reasons, it could also be those sins in my life that I'm yet to repent it. Oh. Now, as we are about to partake in the communion this morning, I want you to revisit yourself, your life. I don't want you to rebuke yourself or criticize yourself or judge yourself. I just want you to re-examine yourself. What are those sins in my life that are distancing me from God? What are those sins in my life that are separating me from God this morning? And again, another question is, does that mean God doesn't, is, he doesn't care for me or he doesn't like me? Of course. God loves me, and that's why he provided a cure. He took God, his only begotten son, to cure me, to, to reconnect me back to him. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, now, now there's a clause here, God loves me, he gave me his son, but there's something I must do. I have to believe so that I will have eternal life. He took God his only begotten son to give me life. He took God his only begotten son to reconnect me back to him. You see, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, it's, it's not a new narrative or a new story. Every Friday or every Sunday, brothers and sisters come around and they share great messages, remind us about Jesus Christ and here. So it's not new of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But this is what I've come to realize. If I want to live a life not separated from God, if I want to be conscious and cognizant of God's love, mercy, and most importantly, God's grace, a daily remembrance, not a weekly, a daily remembrance of Jesus Christ's death on the cross of Calvary is extremely important if I want to do that. If I want to be conscious, if I want to be cognizant of God's love, if I want to live a life that is not far away from God, I have to remember Jesus Christ's death, sacrifice, God's love every single day of my life, and not just weekly. Because the true definition of God's love and mercy was revealed to us on the cross of Calvary. First John explained it very well. He said, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only big son into the world that we might live through him. Now, this is very interesting. They say, this is love. It's not because I love God, but because he loved me and he sent his son as a donor sacrifice for my sin. It's, it's, it's not because of my love. It's not because of my work. It's not because of how wonderful I am. In fact, the Bible, the same scripture said, while I was a sinner, he loved me. It's not because of how faithful I am but because he loved me to the extent that he sent his one and only son as an atoning sacrifice for us. And I have a six month going to sell one daughter. I won't leave that girl for anybody two days. Now, I, I, can't, I can't imagine then leaving her to go die for somebody. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this great time given to us to come together to fellowship, to remember your sons there on the cross of Calvary. We are not righteous, we are not perfect, but every single day, every single moment of our life, we fall short of your glory in one way or the other. But God, your love supersedes even all our shortcomings. However, you've got standard when it comes to sin. And I believe and I hope that we've been reminded today how much we have to be careful. We need to watch ourselves. We need to think about it. What are those things in my life that are distancing me from God? Please help me to stay close to you. Help us to stay close to you. Help us to remember Jesus Christ there on the cross of Calvary every single day, moment of our life, so that we will live a life that is very close to you and not far away from you. Please bless the bread and the wine. Bless the remaining part of the service. Let us all be encouraged. Let us be motivated. And let us all have a great time in fellowship. Thank you. We love you. And just my prayer, thanksgiving. Amen.
my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name, you are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up, when I am dry, you fill my cup, you are my We're part of the International Churches of Christ, and today we're going to hear an incredible story of faith spanning two continents. Jean Vier, a deaf man in Burundi, was a man who wanted to know God. He felt like local churches weren't offering biblical teaching, and his journey led him to the deaf ministry of the International Churches of Christ Facebook page. He eventually connected with deaf disciples Harold Smith and Zach Lotang. Every Saturday, the brothers from Los Angeles would study the Bible with Jean Vier online. Jean Vier started sharing what he was learning with other deaf individuals. Disciples connected Jean Vier with the church in Bujumbura and fronted funds to hire sign language interpreters so he could participate in services. On February 23rd, 2021, Jean Vier was baptized as the first deaf disciple in the Burundi church. He regularly journeys to surrounding villages to teach deaf children sign language and raises money so they can afford a formal education. The Los Angeles and Austin, Texas churches have funded many of Jean Vier's outreach initiatives to the community. We praise God that he worked across continents to bring Jean Vier to the faith, but he didn't stop there. Soon, there were three deaf brothers in the ministry in Burundi. Romain came to Burundi from the church in the Ivory Coast to train Jean Vier to study the Bible and lead small group discussions in the deaf ministry. And three more disciples were added to the ministry. Jean Vier's faith and search for God has led to six deaf disciples in the Burundi church. God uses simple steps of faith to do amazing things. And it's incredible to see what he can do when we partner with him in faith. Thanks for joining us and God bless. Good morning, church. It's a joy to be together again on a Sunday morning. Uh, let's take a few minutes before we uh, listen to the sermon today. Rex and Anne, who are from the Dubai church, just lost their grandchild a couple of days ago, seven years old. She died of dengue. And you cannot imagine what the parents are going through, what Rex and his family are going through. But let's take a minute to, to just pray for them, pray for the family, because even as Jamila is connected back with God or with, with the arms of our Lord, it is not an easy 
scenario for the family. And we know the entire family and they're all in Philippines at this point. And Rex joins them this week, but let's be keeping them in our prayers. Let's take a few seconds to just keep them in our prayers. It is overwhelming when you think about Jamila and the fact that she's not anymore with us. Uh, but let's prepare our hearts and minds even as we listen to the sermon this morning. We have special guests all the way from the Turning Point Church in LA. Um, you know, I met David recently, thanks to uh, Peter Wong, who's getting married to Tele, who's from the al Barsha ministry this following month. And uh, obviously, Dubai is becoming a destination for people to get united. Uh, but, but the joy is to be able to meet a gentleman like David. We need to listen to his story, and hopefully we'll get to know more of him through his lesson. But when he was a teenager, he realized that all the propaganda he hears about the Russians may not be true. And so he set out all the way to Russia, away from USA, to be able to get to know more about that country. And guess what? In Russia, he gets invited by the Russians, and they asked him if he would like to study the Bible. And he thought they were asking him to teach them the Bible. So he says, yes, he goes to church. And sure enough, he, he studies the Bible, hears about discipleship and realizes he himself needs to become one. And so he becomes the first American in Russia in 1991 who becomes a disciple. At the same time in 1991, a Stockholm girl goes to Berlin to work and she becomes a disciple and Sissy uh, gets reached out to in Berlin, becomes a disciple, and then they get joined together in matrimony in the year 1995, I believe, the same year as we got married. And uh, since then, they were serving in, in Russia, administrative, administratively over, overseeing the work in Eurasia before they went back to LA. And now recently they got appointed as elders in the church with both their children, uh, Michael and Christina, disciples in the Lord. You know, what, what, what is uh, heartening is to note that they have really understood uh, the needs of the church and they have decided to dive deep into a deep understanding of psychology and neuroscience. And they try and combine that with spiritual practical living. And they help many to be able to come to terms with their own grief and their own uh, challenges that they face, whether it's their marriage, whether it's their life. And so they actually have something called a Philippians 4-8 mindset ministry, which means they help people to look at whatever is beautiful, whatever is lovely, whatever is forthcoming from the Lord. So it's a pleasure to have you, David and Sissy, today with us. And we look forward to hearing you uh, and be, being encouraged from your sharing of God's word. We have one more song. Let's prepare our hearts and mind, brothers and sisters, even as we listen to the sermon this morning. Sending on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing on the promises, standing on the promises 
church. Uh, I cannot tell you how encouraged we are uh, to be with you here uh, tonight, this morning, well, together. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, I feel like I got a big dose of antivirus uh, from seeing all these happy faces and all the worship songs we've done together. So, uh, and thank you. Is it uh, Tassin who did the communion? Tassin? Thank you, brother. And you're doing a great job with your little baby girl there. Well done. Well done. Uh, I uh, And first of all, I want to thank you also for being an uh, incredible host and uh, helping the love connection happen with uh, Tede and Peter. Uh, so thank you guys for being a church of great love, uh, international love. And uh, we are grateful to even be a little tiny part of that miraculous story with uh, Tede and Peter. So thank you guys. I just wanted to say that I'm so excited um, to be here with you, to see all your faces. And uh, like Jacob shared, uh, here I am, the Swedish girl who met this American guy. I moved to Moscow, was part of, so I, I, I've been in the, the uh, Berlin church in Germany, and then I was in the Stockholm church in uh, Sweden, and then I was in the Moscow church, thanks to David. And now here I am, um, in Los Angeles, in America. And it's so just encouraging for my soul to see every face on the screen as I can see all of you. And I know that each of you have a unique story, how God pulled you out from wherever you were at. And he put you right where he wanted you, where you could seek him and find him. And I'm just encouraged um, that that is who our God is, that we are coming from all walks of life. And here we are loving God together. So I'm going to let you hear David. He's going to share some thoughts and I'm actually going to say good night because it's midnight here. So I'm <laughs> going to go to bed. So that's all I wanted to say. God bless you all. And, um, thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you. Cease. All right. I, I think Jacob is a very clever man. Uh, this is one way to make sure that a preacher doesn't speak too long. Ask him to speak at midnight. So, uh, so uh, this is really clever. I re I'm really impressed by Jacob. Uh, so, guys, um, as Jacob, I think, mentioned, I, uh, a few years ago, went back to school and uh, got my degree in psychology and counseling. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, in certain circles, I'm known as the brain guy because I cannot stop learning about the brain. Uh, did you know, do you know who created your brain? It's not a trick question. Okay, God gave you your brain. He created your brains, okay? So I have this very uh, important expression that I think is very true. If you know how something works, you will use it better. OK, so I think that that is a very interesting truth for many things in life. But I think it is especially true when we understand how God has designed the brain. We actually use our brains better. In fact, I think that's one of the most important things about the Bible. The Bible is actually this book, this living book that actually helps when we listen to it, when we meditate on it, when we dwell on it it actually influences the way our brains actually understand and perceive life and challenges and everything about life. And uh, I, th I hope tonight that I can give you, or sorry, this morning, I can give you just a couple of tools that can help you take really great care of your brains 
which will turn over into a more abundant, incredible spiritual life. So are you guys game? Excellent. I want to do a shout out to that Bible talk. Is it Al Kisais? Al Kisais Bible talk. Way to go, guys. You're there's like eight of you in that little room there. That's awesome. Okay. So uh, I mean, I'm going to share my screen so you don't have to look at my mug uh, here during the lesson. And let's see here. This my lesson today is called the practice of awe. Now, I know I'm kind of borrowing uh, on the importance of understanding the English language here, but have you ever experienced an awe moment with God? I actually know you have. <laughs> if you've studied the Bible, if you uh, learned what it was to be a disciple and you made this decision at some point in your life to commit your life to God, to be a disciple, a learner of Jesus Christ for the rest of your life, and you got baptized... Somewhere in that process, you had an awe moment. You were amazed. And so I want to talk a little about today about the value and the importance of the practice of awe. Uh, now, Jesus is my favorite Jewish person, but this is my close second favorite Jewish person that I know. Albert Einstein said this, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Now, as followers of Christ, I imagine we all agree on which option we should live our lives, right? Everything is a miracle. But I know sometimes miracles can slip right under our nose and we may not even notice maybe the dozens or hundreds of miracles that are going on all the time in our lives. And I want to help us see more of those miracles by some interesting skills I want to give you today. Uh, the study of awe has originally been done in the, in the psychology field by studying and interviewing astronauts. And there's a strange phenomenon. When astronauts have gone out into space, they have seen just the massiveness of the planet. They've seen the stars. They've been out there in the middle of, of space. They come back very changed men and women. They see a very interesting shift in the majority of people that have come back from that experience. They call it the overview effect. And what they've noticed from studying astronauts that come back from that kind of experience is they have a very different trajectory of their life after this awe experience. Many of them talk about um, no longer being citizens of a country, but they feel more like citizens of the entire planet. Like they feel more united with people from all different places and backgrounds. They feel more uh, a sense of connectedness to other people, um, to um, uh, other ideas. They're much more uh, open-minded and, and, and more at peace with listening to people of all different perspectives. They also come back with a very interesting curiosity about meditation. In other words, they tend to be more drawn to a slower pace of life than before that experience. And also they practice a lot of altruism. They come back very engaged in wanting to be helpful to their communities. Now, to me, what I just said sounds like a disciple, <laughs> correct? I hope we all are interested in those particular things. But what's interesting is we've learned that the experience of awe is not limited to these big experiences like going out into space. We do not have to go out into space to have this effect. But a colleague of mine, Jonah Paquette, he actually works at the same um, medical institute that I work at, uh, made this very interesting observation about awe. It turns out awe contributes to creating social connection increasing generosity and kindness, and breeding curiosity. The benefits of being awestruck include being happier, less materialistic, able to grow and change, and being more humble. Instead of only seeking awe experiences by marveling at the vastness of the universe, the real challenge, and this is the challenge that I want to talk about today, is to savor the extraordinary in the ordinary. Opportunities for awe are all around us. 
which kind of reminds me of something we've all read in Acts 17. It says, God is near every one of us. He is always near, always there to give us an experience of awe. Now, people who have studied awe, they realize that there are certain qualities to ensure that you have an awe experience. Um, and these, the, this is basically the formula they've come up with. To have an awe experience, it has to be vast. Vast, not simply like in size, although size can be a very awe-inspiring quality, but it either has to be very, very big or it has to be very, very dynamic, like, like it catches your attention, right? Or makes you really engage with wanting to observe and catch details of something. And the two aspects of vastness that this can work in is areas of perception and conception. So perceptional means your senses, and I'm going to give you a few examples here. Think about things that you've looked at that were absolutely stunning to look at. Okay. Husbands, do yourselves a favor. Look at your wife right now and say, wow, you are just stunning visually to me, my darling. Okay. I just helped you out, brothers. You're, you're welcome. So when you look at something that is just absolutely stunning to look at, like you can't believe how beautiful that is or how fascinating that, that is. That is an example of perceptional vastness. Remarkable music. I mean, we heard some amazing music here today, right? But we've all had experiences with songs that have made you feel things. I used to be a, a, a classical trombone player. I remember playing music and my hair on the back of my head would just stand up because this music was just so powerfully moving. That is awe. Intricate details of art, right? Whether it's pottery, whether it's something painted, any type of art, when you catch the details of it, all of you, I can see in your living rooms right now, you have artwork around, right? Why did you do that? Because you are fascinated by the beauty of that art and the intricacies of it. Mesmerizing touch, uh, we are, I've already seen a baby here at church, uh, which is beautiful. Uh, has anyone here held a baby ever? Okay, we've all done that, right? Just imagine touching the toes of a baby. Just, just think about it for a second. Touching those little tiny toes, that mesmerizing touch. Or if you don't have a baby handy, what about a puppy? Have you ever touched a puppy? I mean, come on, that soft skin and it's so cute and smooth. I mean, just touching it is amazing. That is awe. That is perceptional vastness. Captivating aromas. Just take a moment, you know, next time before you eat a gourmet meal or you fix your food, just slow down before you pray. Just take a smell. Just smell each item on your plate. Just notice the ability that you have to just smell things, right? Uh, wives, I want you to smell your husband. Never mind. Don't do that one. Don't do that one. Uh, but you get my point. You get my point. So perceptional vastness is one way that we experience awe. The other is conceptional vastness. Now, this is when we come across ideas, something that in terms of an idea or concept, it just blows your mind. So, for example, beautiful poems, or if you've ever listened to a song several times and you start memorizing the lyrics because the lyrics are so just inspiring, that is awe. Uh, I happen to be a very, um, I'm very obsessed with quotes. <laughs> I love collecting quotes. Uh, my latest favorite one is, courage is not the absence of fear, but the decision that there is something more important than fear. Now, that quote just blows my mind. Like it makes so much sense. And yet it helps me understand courage better. It helps me understand the relationship with fear that I know God wants me to have, that it, there's something always more important than fear. But intriguing quotes give me awe because it helps me understand something beyond the, just my normal understanding. That's awe. Paradigm shifting ideas. OK, uh, obviously, we all studied the Bible at one point. There was a paradigm shift when we studied the Bible. Right. At some point, there was that click 
And we thought, wait a minute, this book, I don't just have to read it, I can live it. That was a paradigm shift. That was an awe moment that changed your life. Mind-blowing epiphanies. Now, I don't have epiphanies every day, but you know what I do? I hang around really smart people that have epiphanies. Uh, Peter Wong, uh, the guy who's going to get married to Tede, he is one of the smartest men I know. Just hanging out with Peter, guess what? I get smarter. It is so cool. And when Peter blesses me and helps me understand something that I didn't understand before, I experience awe with my friend. All right. Isn't that beautiful? This is so cool. And then obviously scripture. Scripture is a constant option <laughs> to experience conceptional vastness, especially, and this is one of my big hangups about the Bible. I've learned that I have to read the Bible slowly. <laughs> have you ever read the Bible? Like you've read like a page or two and then you pause and go, wait a minute. What did I just read? Has anyone ever done that besides me? Okay, well, I happen to be that kind of guy and I have to read it slow. Like I've got to really catch those words and what are they really communicating and saying? I love this passage in Romans. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. Now, if you stop right there, it already doesn't make sense. This is conceptional vastness. How do they clearly see something that is invisible? Like, well, I, what does that mean? But I get it. I believe it. I know what I just read is true. But it is also like shifting and stretching my mind when I slow down and think about, gosh, it's true. I clearly see invisible qualities of God when I look, when I look, his eternal power and divine nature, so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, recently in the last couple of years, I've been really trying to understand more and more about the original Hebrew, uh, where the New Testament was, or the Greek, that, where the New Testament was written. And what's interesting about the word knowing the Western mindset of knowing is very different than the Eastern mindset of knowing. And you all are on that side of the planet. You probably know this better than me. But when a Western mindset thinks about knowing, we think about information. Very black and white. <laughs> I know God or I do not know God. But in the Eastern mindset, and when Jews in the first century heard that, that term of knowing, what that meant for them was, experience experiencing something it wasn't oh i know john no i experience john <laughs> i know what it's like to talk to him i i can even imagine how he thinks it's a very deeper understanding so when i look at that i try to replace that with phrases like this in this text so they have no excuse for not experiencing god god wants us to not just know him God wants us to experience him in all kinds of fascinating ways, which is why I know God wants us to experience awe on a regular basis. The other quality of awe that we see in studies is the concept of transcendence. So whatever you are focused on or looking at or admiring, it has to be vast, either in size or its dynamics but it also has to include transcendence. And I'm going to pull out the dictionary to help me out with this. What does transcendent mean? It means exceeding your normal limits. Um, extending your line beyond the limits of your ordinary experience or ordinary knowledge. In other words, when you experience awe, it's just mysterious and amazing enough that your mind currently, with your current amount of understanding and knowledge, you can't explain it. You can't explain it. It's that beautiful, captivating mystery, right? I can't explain it, but yet I know it's amazing. That is awe. Now, can, we, uh, can I ask you to put some things in the chat? I want you to look at this picture and just in the chat, tell me something that you see here that gives you awe. 
What would be awe-inspiring about this picture? Reflection. Oh, the reflection in the water. Yep. We got two votes for reflection. The mirror image. Yep. Uh, the man. Oh, the people there look very, very small compared to those huge mountains around them. Yep. The mountain peaks are amazing. Oh, the symmetry. I mean, I'm not there, but I can see there is calm there, right? The stillness of the moment, right? Okay, you guys are doing great, but you are getting this awe thing. Okay, now can I give you another thing to do? I'm going to give you another picture, and I want you to tell me what is awe about this. You ready? Get set, go. David, what are you talking about? How can there be awe in a paperclip? Brothers and sisters, this is the challenge. To find awe in everything. So yes, some people are already getting, I can tell in the chat. Okay, I can, if I look at this thing really carefully, I can, I can think, wait a minute. How did they create that color yellow? Wait, how did God create my eyeballs in such a way that I can take that picture in and I can even recognize what that color is? Who invented the first paper clip? How long have we had paper clips? Who was that guy? How did God influence him to even think of a paper clip, right? And why are they all over the place in the drawer in my messy kitchen drawer where I can never find one when I need one? That's another mystery about paper clips. But you understand, right? Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, God is so big. He is so profound, and yet he is so small. He is in every aspect of your life. So the goal is we've got to make sure we're trying and striving to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to look in the room you're in right now, and I want you to find something ordinary. And, and please don't point at the person with you uh, that you're watching service with. I'm sorry. I'm talking about an object, something just that looks very ordinary in your room. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is whatever that is, it could be a paper clip. It could be a coffee cup. It could be uh, a souvenir you got um, from a trip many years ago, whatever that ordinary thing is. I want you to take that object. And as soon as church is over, I want you to find the extraordinary in that find the extraordinary in that ordinary object. And then I want you to tell someone about it. Okay. You're going to have some very strange and amazing conversations with people if you'll do this. Okay. All right. Let's move on here. Um, I want to tell you another few reasons why awe is so important. This tree is uh, located across the street from my office where I work. OK, this is in Culver City, California. What I do several times throughout my day when I'm at clinic, this is where my therapy office is. I will between clients, I will literally step outside of my office or if I don't have enough time, I'll just look out my window and I will literally stand and I will gaze at one of these trees on my street. OK, I gaze at it. I look at the colors. I try to see the movement of the leaves. I try to see how amazing that, where does wind come from? And how does wind work? And how wind goes through all those branches. Then uh, lately, this last week, I was looking at this tree and I thought, okay, I'm going to try to count how many branches are on that tree. Wait a minute. How many leaves are on that tree? Do you see what I'm doing here? You, you give yourself the ability to think so that you get more confused or you just get more mystified. Like you're just, it's a complete mystery. You think until you can't quite understand it. And by the way, I will never know how many leaves are on that tree. But just trying to think about it is putting my brain and my mind in that awe state. And I'm telling you, the benefits are amazing. One remarkable phenomenon about awe, and they did this, even just giving people 
uh, a moment to remember an awe event or an awe um, object in their lives or situation, they study this idea called small cell phenomenon. And what they notice is when people have a, a moment of awe or just recalling it's something that gives them awe, it makes them feel small. It shrinks the ego, but it doesn't make us feel inadequate or less than in any way. Rather, it makes us feel more connected to those around us and to the greater world. Now, tell me that is not a definition <laughs> of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do constantly with us. The Holy Spirit wants to constantly nudge us and draw our attention to things that can help shrink our ego. <laughs> not to humiliate us, not to make us feel you know, horrible or pathetic. On the opposite, it's a, to make us feel amazed and more connected and more uh, in awe of people around us. Why? Uh, let me switch this. Uh, let me change this down here. Okay. Why is awe practice essential for peace? If you are not in awe of God or God's creation, you may seek awe in your productivity. And this is when we start doing for God rather than being with God. Do you feel the difference in those two states? God so desperately wants us to be with him rather than simply doing for him, right? How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Again, the Western mindset of how we read the Beatitudes is it's kind of a, if you do this, then you get that. But when you see the way that the Hebrew text is written, when they communicate these types of phrases, what it means is people who are seeing God will be in a blessed state having a pure heart. So really, it's almost reversed. When you start seeing aspects of God in more places, that is what actually helps you develop that pure heart. And from what they studied of awe, it totally makes sense what this scripture is trying to teach. Why is awe practice essential for courage? The simple, the spiritual discipline of awe allows God to strengthen our minds and soften our hearts simultaneously. Now, think about these directions. This is Jesus uh, sending out the disciples on their first mission. And look what he tells them. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. In other words, he says, don't take things that you are normally relying on. Don't take everything that you're familiar with. Okay, he says, I want you to go and have a very different awe experience because I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. See, I think what Jesus is saying here, he was setting them up for awe instead of like having all the stuff that they need to have a secure trip so that everything's in order. And I got all my ducks in a row. He's saying, no. Leave those things behind so that you are just going to be in awe of how you see and rely on God. And you will have courage in that situation I'm sending you in. And look what he says further. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's, he's not just teaching them to not be afraid, but he's giving them awe suggestions, right? He says, think about these types of things. Think about how every bird exists because of the will of God. Think about how God is so amazing. He knows the exact number of hairs on your head. He's trying to give them these awe, these vast thoughts, so that they are shifted and going to be in this 
less fearful state. Awe helps you be courageous. Remember what we said at the very beginning? There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Well, let's shift here what Albert said. Look at this. Jesus gave the people that were criticizing him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be in awe. You will be amazed. See, I think Jesus agrees with what Albert Einstein later said. Jesus looked at everything that was happening was God's doing. Every person that he interacted with, every piece of nature that he walked by, he knew that God was in everything. I think Jesus was in a constant state of awe, which is how he as a human being was able to remain fearless on his mission on earth. Why is awe practice essential for hospitality? When you look at Matthew 25 and the different examples of the people that would be um, taken care of and in, and in essence be taking care of Jesus. He talks about the hungry, the sick, the naked, and the imprisoned. As the Bible stories show, we don't show hospitality to be like Jesus. We show hospitality to welcome Jesus. Hospitality isn't being like God, but it's welcoming God. It's seeing God into our lives seeing the people around us and seeing God's image in them, seeing God's qualities in people. Brothers and sisters, I know you have been enduring a pandemic for two years. I know this has been challenging on so many levels, but I still want to encourage you to be bold and courageous and, and seek hospitality. The people that you do life with and work with or go to school with, I'm telling you, they need you to help see God in them. Staying in awe of everyone born with the image of God helps keep your ego small and God big. I saw this recent uh, definition of evangelism. Help people see the image of God, the image of Christ in themselves. Evangelism is actually finding God in everyone and finding a way to let them know that. This requires awe toward every person you meet. What an exciting, very different approach to evangelism. It's not going out there to try to bring people to you. No, it's going there, going out and seeing people, observing them catching great things about them or you know celebrating things about them it's catching the good in people and letting them know i'm telling you they will want to come to church if you can help them see the god in them there are only two ways to live with people one is as though no one is a miracle the other is as though everyone is a miracle and this is true there is only one way to live as a disciple you are a miracle. Everything around you is a miracle. And everyone around you is a miracle. Brothers and sisters, my charge for you today, my awe charge, <laughs> is find and enjoy awe. And after you do that, share your awe with others. I believe this is a way that you will truly be a light to everyone around you, because you will be experiencing God in an intimate way with all the ordinary things around you that become extraordinary and helping people around you see that as well. I think you guys will be an amazing impact on the Dubai uh, church there and all the people around you. Thank you so much for letting me be here today. Love you guys. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today for this uh, amazing worship service. 
Uh, the sermon this morning clearly wants us to, you know, think deeper and or to look deeper also as a, uh, that can, you know, uh, when we try to improve our spiritual uh, uh, convictions, right? Being humble and uh, open to different perspectives, you know, that can, you know, help us uh, through our uh, walk of uh, Christianity. And we have to realize that uh, how, in, uh, what you call this, uh, we have to realize of something that uh, beyond the material sense of things, right? Just like what the uh, David has uh, shared to us, the recognition of uh, having that higher ideas. And uh, I believe that pure thinking and right living will uh, bring out the desired result that uh, we want to be. And most importantly for her, today's uh, message is savor that extraordinary feeling or experience you know, by not just taking the simplicity of it, but rather think of the importance it can have or what it can give in our lives. Yes, uh, and we, when we are having a grateful heart, we treat everything as miracle in our life. The quote, by treating extraordinary in the ordinary, remind us to appreciate everything, even little thing as a blessings from God. When we, Whenever we feel all of, every creation of God, it helped us to have a positive uh, perspective of others and our surroundings. Inspiring scripture help us in our down moment. And it reminds us also to explore our mind on everything we see around us and on what we are doing for God. And it helped us to find joy and peace. It helped us to appreciate the people in our life and of course our God. So be all of God and his creation and his people. And, and with that, thank you, David. Uh, you gave us a very insightful sermon today. Uh, we hope to hear from you and CC uh, soon. And uh, the message today is uh, something we all can think about and reflect on. And we would uh, also want to give our thanks to Chris and Heidi for their warm welcome. And to Tosin for that uh, amazing communion message. The song ministry and technical teams always uh, are always thankful for your great contributions and making our worship service available through this platform. So before we close out, let's see this uh, week's announcement. For those who are unable to attend in today's service, the recording will be available in ICLC UAE channel on YouTube. Next worship service will be on the 19th of June via Zoom. This coming Tuesday, we will have Mark Templar for the fifth session of his Cross of the Savior class. And uh, leaders meeting will be, have, will have their meeting at uh, 3 p.m. later today. Yes, this Kingdom will have their respective classes today. Can we check with your coordinators and teachers for the timings? Teens will have their meeting on Friday at 7 p.m. Learning from the Book of Mark will continue. Regular monthly contribution can be given to your pers uh, respective finance representative or family group leader. Continue praying for Ukraine for peace and for their protection. Lastly, uphold each other in prayer. Stay safe as much as possible and be cautious still as COVID pandemic is not yet over. Okay, so let's all pray to God. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this opportunity to worship you. You have spoken to different individuals today. And with those words, may guide us, fill us up with wisdom, spiritual understanding that we need daily in our lives. Continue to shower us uh, with your love and grace. Keep us protected at all times and forgive our wrongdoings. Again, we thank you and we love you. Pray all this to your son, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Thank you.